Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. It was wonderful. Um, I've never taken the Bible literally ever um, and was thrown out of confirmation classes for daring to suggest that it might just be a story. And um, I come from a um, tradition of mysticism, so I work as a medium. And the Bible is very clear to me in the mystical aspects of um, the resurrection. So as a medium, it's normal to me to be speaking to dead people and to people who died a long time ago and to channel information from them. So when I look at the Bible, it's more t I can understand that some of the Gospels were written through channeling, um, which seems sensible to me. But I'm, I'm interested in um, religion's opinion on, on mysticism and mediums. Because if you are a medium, you can hear people who have lived. I'm not going to get into a conversation about what a medium is and how authentic they are. That's just beyond my pay grade. Uh, when I wrote my book on why I believe in life after death, I examined that. I examined out-of-the-body experiences. I examined reincarnation. And I came to the conclusion that I can't find out enough to write about it with any sort of integrity, that all I'm doing is doing anecdotal kind of writing, and I don't believe that works very well. So I don't want to enter the debate, but I don't want to suggest by that that everything you say is not true, because I'm quite convinced that there are levels of communication that human beings have only just begun to try to understand. Uh, and we've all had experiences where we wake up in the middle of the night, and begin to think about somebody, and we get a telephone call the next morning that they had a heart attack at just that moment, or they were in an automobile accident, or all sorts of things. That's anecdotal, but there's just too much of it to be ignored. Uh, so I'm open to that, but I'm not willing to write about it because I don't have enough knowledge to write about it. But I think it's a, it's a good comment. When I look at the resurrection stories in the New Testament, and I've just been in my column, I've just been doing a series analyzing every one of them, the fascinating thing to me is that they agree on almost no detail. And I don't know what that means, but that's just a fact. They agree on almost no detail. Now, some people might read that and say, well, that means none of them are true. Now, I read it, and it means that there's a powerful experience that's so real that we don't have a vocabulary to put them into a place where we can communicate it. And when we do, there are sorts of distortions in it. And we've got to look past the distortions and try to perceive whatever the reality was in that experience. And I think, it's a, I think there's a reality there that I do not deny. But thank you for your question. What I'm wondering is, and certainly the last point, we're about taking Christianity forward, whether, whether we can draw much, whether you feel that we can draw from Eastern traditions. I go to church, but also attend a meditation sangha, and have found writers like Eckhart Tolle very helpful in um, bridging a gap, you might say, between Christianity and Buddhism. Um, I just really wondered if you think there's an answer taking Christianity forward, or relying on the East, you might say. Well, I think if you go deep enough into any of the faith traditions of the world, you escape the limits. I don't believe God's a Christian, much less an Anglican. <laughs> uh, you know, the idea that, that God has to live within our human worship tradition, our human framework, is almost idolatrous to me. That doesn't mean that, that I want to get rid of Anglicanism or Presbyterianism or whatever. Uh, I don't want to get rid of any of those things. I just want us all to travel in them so deeply that we too escape our own limits. And if the Muslims and the Jews and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Christians go into their faith tradition deeply enough and walk far enough, I have a conviction that they'll come to a common ground. And in that common ground, I can say to my Buddhist friends, this is what I've received by walking the Christ path, and I want to share it with you. And they can say to me, this is what I've received by walking the Buddhist path, and I want to share it with you. 
And none of us has to give up the treasures of our own tradition, but all of us are enriched by taking on the treasures of so many more. And I think if we don't get to that kind of understanding of the role of religion in human society, that the alternative is genocide, because we spend our time killing each other in the name of our God. And that seems to me to be sort of foolish. It's even biblical. I can take you to a text in 2 Samuel where God directs King Saul, uh, not, you know, God directs the prophet Samuel to speak to King Saul and says, King Saul, you are to go to war against the Amalekites. And in that war, you are to kill every man, every woman, every child, every suckling, every ox, and every ass among the Amalekites. That's the Bible saying God is endorsing genocide. Now, don't hand me that book and say this is the word of God and have that in it and not be aware of it. That's what we've got. That's why we've got to rescue the Bible from the minds of literal-minded people without destroying the Bible in the process. The alternative we give to our world is you either accept the Bible literally or you pitch the Bible onto a junk heap. I think there's a better alternative. And I spend my time trying to open up a new possibility to people of faith about this holy book that I happen to treasure. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, you do indeed spend your time changing the world. And some of us, many of us, I guess, are right behind you with that but we're all working away in our little corners what hope do you really think there is for changing the message that the clergy give from the pulpit changing the world and changing christianity good question and i think we have got to stop thinking that it's our job to convert the world if you go back to the Bible, the story, you find over and over that Jesus uses only minority images. The Christian church is not going to transform the world and become the Holy Roman Empire again. But maybe we're going to be the salt in the soup of life. Maybe we're going to be the light in the darkness of life. Maybe we're going to be the yeast in the bread that will give quality and meaning to it. And maybe we ought to stop thinking about Christendom and being triumphant and and all important, and accept our role as minority people and go about being life and leaven and light and, and whatever else, salt in the world. Maybe that's the better way for us to understand. I'm encouraged. I mean, there are 170 of you here today. This is a Sunday afternoon. It's not church going season. In fact, Sunday morning is no longer church going season <laughs> in most of the Western world. But I find a hunger everywhere I go. For something that makes sense, that's something that relates me to transcendence. I still think there's a great big God-shaped hole in the, in the human heart that no matter what we try, nothing but God's going to finally satisfy. But I don't think there'll ever be a majority movement, and I'm, I've never been a majority. I've really cultivated the art of being a minority, and uh, I think that's kind of fun. In the civil rights movement in America, I was not very courageous, certainly not at the beginning of it. When Martin Luther King marched from Selma to Montgomery, I wasn't there to march with him. I was serving a little church in eastern North Carolina of tobacco farmers, and they were not at all interested in marching with Martin Luther King, Jr. And I didn't know how to identify with that, but I picked my hymns very carefully. Next morning, our choir came in singing, Lead on, O King Eternal. And nobody in the congregation got it, not a soul. So my witness was totally lost. Now, now when the schools were desegregated in Tarboro, my witness was not lost because it had now come home to us and we had to deal with it and we had to deal with hostility. And, uh, and I had the incredible honor of being named public enemy number one by the Ku Klux Klan in Edgecombe County, North Carolina, which just proves that if you choose your pond small enough, you can be a very big fish in it. <laughs> but I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to accept minority status and be leaven in the lump of life. And I think we have integrity when we do that. Thank you for your question. It's people like you, um, 
overlooked the fact that resurrection was not by any means something limited to Jesus and not limited to what Paul claimed about seeing him, but it was right in with those who you are championing today, the Jewish people, resurrection was all very much part of their religion for thousands of years. I, one of the greatest prophets in the Jewish history is Elijah. And he raised the dead. There was resurrection involved with him. And then Jesus was a preacher and a teacher, oh yes, and the Bible a record of his teachings, but he was a resurrectionist as well. That is, he healed the sick, he had multitudes to, to, to minister to, like you referred to the feeding of the 5,000. That was because there was such a multitude uh, looking for him for healing that they, they had to be uh, provided for, otherwise they would have fainted on their journeys. That's a good question. Let me try to address it. First of all, there's almost nothing about resurrection in the Old Testament. Uh, well, that's not quite accurate. Raising the dead by Elijah was not resurrection. It was raising them back into this life. They presumably would have to die again. The story of Lazarus that you refer to is in the 11th chapter of John's Gospel. And there are all sorts of things in that story that make you know that's not literal history. Uh, I don't know that I've got time, but let me try. Uh, that's the only story of the resurrection, of the raising somebody from the dead in the New Testament that can't be replicated with a story from Elijah or Elisha. Elijah raised a widow's only son. Elisha raised a child. There are only five resurrection stories in the New Testament. Three of them are the same story. The daughter of Jairus is raised in three different versions, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. The widow's son only son is raised at Nain and Lazarus is the last one raised in the 11th chapter. The interesting thing about the Lazarus story is that Mary and Martha who are said to be the sisters of Lazarus have appeared in the story before but they never had a brother until John writes. Next thing that's sort of unusual about it is that Jesus waits for four days so that Lazarus can die before he goes in response to Martha's plea. He gets berated by both Mary and Martha. And they say, the Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus says to them, do you believe in the resurrection? And then they talk about the resurrection and the, and the dead. And then in a very dramatic scene in the fourth gospel, Jesus walks with Mary and Martha out to the tomb with a whole host of people, including his critics. And as they approach the tomb, Martha says to Jesus, Oh, Jesus, don't take the stone away from the tomb. And Jesus says, Why not? And she says, He's been dead for four days. And King James Bible says, quote, And already he stinketh, unquote. The Revised Standard Version changes that and says, Already there's an odor, a little bit more discreet in the Revised Standard Version. In any event, they roll the stone away, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, bound in his grave clothes, looking like somebody from the Adams family on TV, uh, his feet bound, his arms bound, comes walking like this out of the tomb. And Jesus says, take the burial cloth off of him and let him free. And nobody writes about this story for 65 years. John is written between 95 and 100. Nobody seems to know about this story to John Wright. That's not history. Well, I think I can tell you where it comes from, and I did that in a, when I wrote my book on life after death and why I believe in it. I think what John did is take the parable of Lazarus and Dives out of the Gospel of Luke and turn it into history. If you know that parable, and it's a really great parable. If you know that parable, Lazarus is a beggar, Dives is a rich man, they both die. Lazarus goes and quote, the bosom of Abraham. That was a Jewish image of heaven. The bosom of Abraham. If, if I were going to spend eternity lying in somebody's bosom, I don't believe I want it to be Abraham's. <laughs> but Dives goes to a place of torment. And in this parable, they can talk to each other. So Lazarus says, Father Abraham, 
Send Lazarus down here with some water. It's pretty hot down here. And Abraham says, Lazarus, you can't get there from here. And then Davi says, well, if you can't send help to me, send Lazarus back to my brothers, lest they come to this place of torment. And Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe even if one is raised from the dead. And John takes that story and he turns it into a historical narrative. And he is raised from the dead. And exactly what the parable says happens. They immediately move to crucify him. They do not believe even if one is raised from the dead. That's a very different way to read that miracle story. And the raising of the child is an Elijah story being rewritten. The raising of the widow's son at Nain is an Elijah story being rewritten. Many of the miracles in the New Testament were Old Testament stories being magnified and retold about Jesus. And I traced all of that in a book called Jesus for the Non-Religious. I don't think the miracles are miraculous. I think they're signs. One of the great things that I learned from studying the fourth gospel is that that writer changes all the miracles into being signs. The difference is a miracle is supposedly a deed you can observe. A sign is something that points to a meaning that the miracle can never quite capture. And I think if we begin to read the miracle stories of the New Testament as signs and not as miracles, we'll be better off. Do you believe in the evolution of the human species? What role has Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth to add to that evolutionary belief, spiritual evolutionary yeah. belief? Uh, one interesting idea that appeals to me is that Jesus of Nazareth is about emptying. Thank you. Well, let me say, first of all, I don't think it's possible not to believe in evolution. Uh, I think anybody that doesn't believe in evolution is simply uneducated and uninformed. Every medical school in the world operates on evolutionary principles. And the Christian church has had a very hard time relating to Darwin and his thinking. Uh, it's really sort of, sort of sad. Christian church still talks about original sin and the fall and how they've got to be rescued and redeemed. Original sin doesn't make any sense if there wasn't an original perfection. That is, you can't fall unless you have an original perfection, and you can't be rescued if you haven't fall, fallen. And so the whole way we tell the Jesus story becomes nonsensical. When I look at life, and again I trace this in my book called Eternal Life, A New Vision, this planet is part of the, of the universe that was formed in something we euphemistically call the Big Bang somewhere between 13.7 and 13.8 billion years ago. And that's pretty well documented. And this universe is still expanding. And with our computerized knowledge, we can turn it backwards and we can go back to the place where it was one incredible density. We know we're somewhere between 13.7 and 13.8 billion years old. But when the universe was begun, it was all material. It was chemicals and metals. No life was in it. And it wasn't until about 3.8 billion years ago that life came into being on this planet. Where did it come from? Somehow out of matter, life emerged. Don't ask me how. But that's, it has to come from what is. And what is was matter. And then suddenly, about 10 billion years after matter was formed, Life emerged out of matter. And then you keep following that process. And this thing called life breaks into two distinct lines. When that happened, we're not sure. But one's plant life and one's animal life. They're deeply interdependent. They fed off each other quite literally. And then on the animal side of life, suddenly consciousness emerged out of life. Where did it come from? It had to be there all the time or it couldn't have emerged. So matter gives way to life and life gives way to consciousness. And sometimes about maybe as recent as 250,000 years ago, consciousness crossed a boundary into self-consciousness. 
And that's when human beings appeared. Human beings are self-conscious creatures. We know that we are alive. We know that we will die. Animals don't know that they're alive, they just are. Animals don't know that they're gonna die. I've never met an animal that wrote a last will and testament uh, or made preparations for its burial. Oh, you, people tell me all about elephants who go to burial grounds, but that's instinctual behavior. Human beings are frightened, self-conscious creatures who know that they're mortal. And when I look at Jesus, I see another dimension of humanity where you go from self-consciousness into a kind of universal consciousness where you see yourself as one with that which is ultimately real and ultimately holy. So I think I see how Jesus fits into that process. And I'm certainly not the first one to develop this. A great Roman Catholic paleontologist uh, in the early 1930s, uh, Teilhard de Jardin, developed this as he tried to relate Christianity to his understanding of paleontology. Yeah, I think we're, that's the kind of debate I think the church ought to be having instead of the debate about whether women should be ordained. You know, nothing bores me more than that. You know, and, you know, the gay debate's just about as dumb. Uh, anyway, that's... Uh, the church spends major amount of time debating that which is minimally important. Why should a woman not be ordained? Let me, let me close with this. As my wife says, that's the last question. It's always fun to po posit it this way. The, the reason why the Christian church historically did not ordain women was that we defined women as not bearing the image of God. Only men had the image of God, so therefore only men could stand before the altar and represent God to the people. Well, that's a really strange idea. And the way you test it is you stand a man and a woman side by side to try to figure out where in the man's body the image of God lives if it doesn't live in the woman's body. And so you strip them from head to toe of everything that is sexually identified until the man is down to the single organ that identifies him as male, and then your conclusion has to be, that must be where the image of God lives. <laughs> now that is patently ridiculous. It is humanity, self-conscious humanity, that reveals the image of God. It's not maleness or femaleness. And we have treated women shamefully and the two largest churches in the Christian world today, the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic, still do not think women are competent to be ordained priests and bishops. And I'm the father of daughters, and, and I don't want anybody telling me my children can't be the Pope the moment they're born. So uh, I had a conversation with the Archbishop of Newark one time, my counterpart, when I was an active bishop. His name is Theodore McCarrick. He later became the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington. I said, Ted, the Roman Catholic Church will never get its mind straight about women until your priests have children. And he looked at me as if he didn't know how to process what I had just said. But I think that's true. You have a bachelor mentality that has no daughters, and no wives, and you're trying to make them define humanity for males and females. It's just never going to work. And the sooner they realize that, the better they'll be. I have great hope for Pope Francis. My sense is it couldn't have gotten any worse than Benedict XVI. So anything would be a step in the right direction. But this is an enormous step in the right direction in consciousness and in every other way. So I have great hope for future relationships where the idea of women and birth control and abortion and homosexuality won't be the primary agenda that the church talks about. Church doesn't know anything about sexuality. I mean, how can a bachelor institution know much about sexuality? That's what we are, a bachelor institution. What does a bachelor institution do? We decide that the ideal woman is a permanent virgin. To whom? Only to a celibate male. Well, who was doing the defining? And we've all been victimized by that mentality because we were told they were defining in the name of God. Well, God is bigger 
than the prejudices of the Christian church. You all have been a wonderful audience today, and I thank you for coming. I hope I'll see you again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, David. You want to tell him to go somewhere? You can tell him to go for it. I'm sure I'm standing in front of about 200 people who'd love to do this job, and thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts for that um, session. Um, it's a great privilege for me to, uh, to be able to thank somebody who acquired salvation through marriage. Uh, my wife is also English, uh, but for those of you who recognised my accent, you've probably worked out it was an unnecessary expense on my part. Uh, but we... We're, we're absolutely delighted to, to, to thank you. Could I also thank the uh, Ainsley and the team in, this, in Holy Trinity for their hospitality. For those of you who can see me from the front, from my shape, you'll realize I'll be incredibly thankful to those supplying the tea and the cakes as well afterwards. Thanks to the team over there. And a special thanks to Susan and Tom Hines of the Maidenhead and Windsor Progressive Christianity Network Group uh, for anchoring this whole thing and putting uh, a real turn of effort into this. Thank you very, very much uh, for organising this. <laughs> Especially to, to Bishop Jack Spong, um, the thank you is not just for this afternoon. Uh, the thanks is for a lifelong commitment uh, and, and a willingness to stand out to make it possible for so many of us to stand with integrity trying to work out our place in the spiritual journey that follows the feet uh, of the Jesus story and thank you very very much for keeping many of us on that journey uh, as we grow older but our thanks and our great privilege today has been to listen to you uh, and to see the, the, the centrality of an intellectualism when it comes to both matters of faith and of other matters of life, if there is such a separation, which many of us would, uh, would argue with. But thank you very much for being that anchor and providing that way forward. Thank it's you. been a great privilege. Thank you very much. Where's your home? In Wales, in Pontypool. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much. Thank you.